So are you ready for the word today? Today is the last day of our series on the Sermon on the Mount. I began looking at this, this, I went through it this week. We started this series on May 3rd this year. Bless you. May 3rd we started on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the 23rd sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. And you say, oh, I've missed some. They're all on our YouTube page. You go to newhopefwc.com, and they're all on there on our YouTube page. Just go to the media page, click YouTube. It'll take you right to our media page, and you can go back and listen to them. Because, listen, this series may be the very series that saves your life. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Because as we're going to find out today, this is the cornerstone that Christ wants us to build upon. This isn't a do this if you're gifted, do this if you're a pastor. This is, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, this is how you should live. This is not a, a hope, something to hope for, Pastor Jesse. This is, oh my gosh, I love Jesus. I've got to live my life. It, it, it's, it's the transformation that... God expects out of our lives. It's not, wow, that was a nice sermon. It's, okay, I'm going to walk out these doors and I'm going to do this. Because as we've, we've read in here, there's some people that just aren't going to make it. There's some people that are hearing the word that aren't getting it. There are people that tell me, I just don't understand. If I don't understand something, I do something about it. I start digging. I come to whatever I can to get understanding. You know, I come on Tuesday nights. I teach Celebrate Life, but I get as much out of what I teach as anything. I come on Wednesday nights to Bible study. We've been teaching Bible doctrine. And the, for January, we're going to go back and we're going to finish out that series on that. But then we're going to teach the book of Revelation from February on. And uh, so you'll have understanding. Because understanding doesn't mean, oh yeah, I get it. Understanding means I'm changing my life because I get it. Amen. I'm fleeing from evil because I get it. I'm going to stop doing the things that I used to do because it doesn't honor God. Because I get it. I have understanding, so I'm not going to do that anymore. So why don't you stand with me today. The title of my message is Rock Solid. We need to be rock solid in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to read out of Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29. It is titled, Build on the Rock. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that we would have an ear to hear and an eye to see what the Spirit of God is saying. That Lord, that the foundation stone, the rock, the word of the Lord, Jesus Christ, Lord. That Lord, if there be any sand in us, Lord, we would shake it off today. And Lord, that we would leave this place, Father God truly with understanding, turning away from the evil of this world, Lord, rejoicing in the Lord God Almighty, walking in the ways of the King of glory, and Father, that we would be enlightened today by your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you know there's two ways to do in everything? There is everybody else's way, and then there's your way right? We all think that. Well, everybody has their way, but I have my way of doing things. And Delana and I, through the years, she's always been the one to do the yard work. She's always been the one to pull the weeds and stuff. And we we had this one house, and we had a third of an acre, so we had lots of flower beds. And and she would go out there, and she had this pink little knee pad, and she had her little gloves and her little shovel. and, And when she would go to weed the flower beds, she would be out there for like eight hours, 
all day, man. And, and she'd be tore up. I'd tell her, jump in the pool before you come in the house, you know. I mean, because she'd be a mess, you know. Sweat and everything, just dirty and grimy. And, and uh, so she told me one day, she said, hey, it's your turn. You can get out there and pull them weeds. I said, absolutely, ma'am. And I, I went and I got me one of them hula hoes. You know, it's kind of a, you know, and I did it in a half an hour. And I raked it up and cleaned it up, and I came in. I said, I'm done. She's like, you can't be done. It takes me eight hours a day to do it. I said, that's because you do it your way. My way takes a half an hour. She says, well, your way, them weeds are going to come back. I'm like, they're going to come back anyways. But she has her way. I have my way of doing it. My way is just really fast because I don't like doing it. She's like, why didn't you buy me a hula ho? (laughs) But Jesus, speaking with authority, lets us know that his way is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through Him. Amen? He is the way. And as I read this passage, he, he uses a word in here 13 times. And that word is therefore. 13 times he used it. It's His effort is to get us to understand that because of what He said, we should be applying it to our lives. And, and with the way He finishes out the sermon... These are not improvements to our life, but it's the foundation for Christian living that we're talking about. It is the way to live. There's not another way, well, I'll, I'll do something else. No, that's, that's sand. If we're going to build upon the rock, we've got to build His way, and He's given it to us. Now, I want to read you this passage again, but I want to read it to you out of the Message Bible, because it, it's just plain as day. Now, it uses some, some strong language, and... I, I'll tell you this. If the language offends you, when I, when I say stupid, um, if, if it's describing you, then you have the opportunity to do something about it. Don't get mad. Can I hear an amen? Okay, so here we go, Matthew, 20, Matthew 7, 24. It says, These words I speak to you are not incidental actions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words. Words to build a life on. You know, we we were talking, somebody mentioned to me, we were talking about the building of the temple in Jerusalem, that, you know, the the temple needs to be built. And and as I've been praying, since I had that conversation, I've been praying, and, and the Lord's just been ministering to me that we are the temple of God. Amen? It is us that His Spirit has been poured out on. It is not Solomon's temple where the glory of the Lord filled that temple. You are the temple of God. Amen? And it is you that God wants to fill. It is you that He wants to fill with His glory. That the light of God will shine in you. Amen? Well, I'm not looking for the temple in Jerusalem. I'm looking for this temple, Ron King, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to flow in the things of God, that the presence of God would flow in me, through me, and out of me. Amen? That I'm being transformed. That I'm being renewed daily. Amen? I don't have to look to Jerusalem to see the temple of God. I can look in this room and I can see the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I look at my brothers and sisters in Jesus, amen? You are the temple of God. Everybody say, I am the temple. Amen. Oh, you said it strong. I like that. <laughs> See, we were, we're building. This is the foundation. Because, listen, they, they say they're looking for the cornerstone of the temple to build it in Jerusalem. We have the cornerstone. Jesus and His Word. We have that. He has given it to us. And he said, if you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who builds his house on solid rock. What happens if you build your house on sand? It sinks. It's going to wash away. Could you imagine it building on the sand at Newport, man? Or down at the wedge when the waves pound? Oh, you just destroy it. 
So rain poured, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed on the rock. And then verse 26. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. And 28, I love this. He said, when Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. Hallelujah. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. Quite a contrast to the religion teachers. This was the best teaching that they had ever heard. Wow. A burst into applause. Let's give the Lord a big hand this morning, huh? Hallelujah, Father. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the rock of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, oh, you get it. Oh, you're the rock. That's the rock. You, you understand. Upon that rock, upon that revelation of who Jesus is, is what I'm building my house upon. See, when we understand the word of God, that's what Christ is burning, building on. I started in May 3rd with an attitude of gratitude, that we would have an attitude that's, that's like Christ, amen? And then I told you to be salt and light. Hey, Holly, throw me a salt shaker, because I know you've got salt shakers sitting there in that booth. Throw me one. Don't hit Tom in the head. Just hit it right here. I'll catch it. Well, I would have tried. <laughs> salt. I, I am Salt. See, that's what we put on it. We gave you one of these a few months ago. Rob, I know you weren't here. Here, you're your salt now. Okay, you are salt. And that's to remind us that every day we are the salt. We are the light. Amen. Jesus declared. He said, I'm the light of the world. But then he said, you know what? You're the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You're the light. And, and then the, and God's saying, hey, don't hide your light, but shine. Amen? Let it shine before men. Let it shine before the world. Let the light flow. And he said, he said we, we did a sermon on, here comes the law. Because the law, Jesus said, I come to fulfill the law, not do away with it. Because it's a good thing that we don't kill each other. It's a good thing we don't commit adultery. It's a good thing that we don't have other gods before us. And then the murder. You know, you hate people. That's committing murder. I don't want to be a hater, amen? You know, they're, they're choosing the church of being haters. I don't hate people. I love people, amen? They, you know, adulterer. Jesus took it a step further. He says, it's not, just, it's not just committing the act. It's working it out in your head that's the adultery. Don't get mar you know, marriage and divorce, he talked about. He said, say no to oaths. Don't make oaths. He said, go the extra mile. Go the, you know, the, the, the Jews were required to carry a centurion's equipment for a mile. But the, the Jews that knew Christ went an extra mile. Because that extra mile, the first mile they had to do it. The second mile, it opened up that centurion's heart to hear what they had to say. And they used that second mile to minister, to share the love of Jesus with people. And we, sometimes we've got to go the extra mile. And that's what I'm telling you with these tickets. Go the extra mile. Touch somebody. Amen? Love your enemies. The hardest thing we'll ever do. Love our enemies. Do good. Do good. Always. And then how to pray. He gave us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Oh, such beautiful words. And then, the heart of fasting. He didn't say, fast if you feel like it. He said, fast. Live a fasted lifestyle. He, he talked about treasures. Where is your treasure? He talked about our eyes, our eye gate. He talked about God or money. You know, who is your God? Is it your money? You know, when you tithe, you're, you're surrendering your money. If you're tithing, you're releasing your money to the Lord. Amen? You're trusting God with your finances. And he says, don't worry. You know, don't worry. That's what man has said, man. Get, get out of the mode of worry and come and give it to the Lord. Amen? Don't worry. God's got this. Amen? Don't worry about ISIS. Don't worry about Islamic stuff coming to our country. God's got it. Amen? You know what? Instead of worrying, come and pray. 
Pastor Jesse will be leading prayer this Friday night out in room two. We need you. We need you to come and pray and seek the face of God with us. So don't worry and don't judge. And as I said, I remember when I did that sermon. When I said don't judge. There are people that will say, don't judge me. And the only person that ever says don't judge me is somebody that's doing something that needs to be judged. <laughs> you know, they're out there doing stuff that they shouldn't do, but they want to come here and they don't want any conviction. They don't want anybody to think bad about what they're doing. They want to be able to do what they're doing out there and come in here and not receive any conviction. I remember, man... Me and, me and Rick went shooting one day, and we were uh, pulling some things up out at the range, and the range master, he came in, and, and come to find out, this is a guy I went to high school with, and he's dropping F-bombs on me and everything, and he's just going on and on, and then this guy is just cussing up a storm, and he says, what are you doing with your life now? I said, man, I said, I passed through New Hope on the corner of 8th and Lincoln. I'm so blessed to be able to pass through the church I was raised up in. He's like, oh, yeah. So he left, and he come back again. And the second time he come back, man, it was like just, you know, maybe a tenth of the F-bombs this time. You know, he's, he's cleaning up his language while he's talking to me, you know. Because he said, I've been there before, you know. And so he, he's, he's mellowing out a little bit. But by the third time he came to talk to me, he's crying. He's sobbing. I, I need to give my life to Jesus today. I need to, I need to, I shouldn't be acting like that, man. I'm so sorry. And man, he, he's like, can you pray for me? And I, and I led him in a prayer and I prayed for him, you know. That's, you know, I didn't judge him, but that conviction will, amen. The Word of God will judge you, amen. That's what the Word of God is meant to do. So when I stand up here and I'm preaching Word, don't do this, and you're doing that, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Let the Word of God Convict you, amen? Not condemn you, but convict you. The difference is, is that we can repent and be healed, amen? Condemnation means you go away sad and you don't repent. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what do I got to do to be saved? He said, well, you know, he went through some of the commandments. and The rich young ruler said, well, I do all that. But Jesus knew that his money was, was his God. And he said, well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And come and follow me. And the man went away sad. Because that was where the line was drawn for him. His money. And he went away sad. Because he couldn't surrender it all to the Lord. Where's your line at? Have you blown up that line? Do you have anything that stops you? I got invited to Thailand. I said, okay, great. I, I looked online, 560 bucks for a ticket to Thailand. I'm like, I emailed back, absolutely, I'll go. So then when we sat down this week, I said, okay, what's it going to take? He said, well, they, they said for the person that they're giving a city to, they need to bring $10,000 with them. I'm like, ooh, that's a lot different than a $562 ticket. I'm like, what, what, what's the $10,000? Well, well, you're given a city to win for the Lord. So you got to pay for the venue, the equipment, and everything to do the crusades. And I'm like, all right. I don't have $10,000. I know somebody that does. Amen? So I'm not saying no. I'm saying, Lord, what do I... He said, I should have got back. He goes, these guys have been planning this for a year. They've all raised their money. I said, well, I don't believe in fundraising. I believe in asking God. So Friday night we prayed. I asked God for $10,000. He wants me to go to Thailand. He'll give me $10,000. Amen? Hey, he gave me $6,000 to go to Pakistan last January. It's nothing for God. So, you know, and then I, I talked about don't give up. And I talked about there's only one way. We talked about checking our fruit. We've talked about, you know, who are you in Christ Jesus? Does Jesus know who you are? Well, is, is he going to say, oh, I know you. Come on. I was going to say, well, what's your name again? I 
I'm, I'm not quite sure I know you. What's it going to be? So, out of all this, what we've talked about since May 3rd has nothing to do with gifts that God gives you. It has nothing to do with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is not for the elite Christian. This is not just for pastors only. This is the normal Christian walk. I, 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 I don't remember. I've read some of the normal Christian life by Watchman Nee. But this is the normal Christian life by Jesus Christ. This is what he is said to do. And this is for everybody that declares that Jesus is Lord. So I've pulled out three points for you. Number one, hearing. You can see the, <laughs> the hearing device that I have there for you. You see the big horns and the guy's sitting in the middle and it's going into his ears. We need to hear from Jesus, amen? We need to hear the word of the Lord. Because this title, he says, whoever hears this saying of mine. But one thing I want to point out, the person on the rock, the person on the sand, they both hear the same thing. They both hear the message. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, it says, He said to me, go, tell, go and tell this people, listen hard, but you aren't going to get it. Look hard, but you won't catch on. Make those people blockheads with fingers in their ears and blindfolds on their eyes so they won't see a thing, won't hear a word. They won't have a clue about what's going on. And yes, so they won't turn around and be made whole. This is how the Lord's describing people that are under judgment. This is how he's describing people that are walking in judgment. They won't hear. You can preach to them, they're not going to hear. They're not going to see. They're not going to get it. They're not going to be able to turn away from their own sin. But listen, people, we're not under judgment yet. Amen? We're under grace. And God says, I've given you an ear to hear and an eye to see what the Spirit is saying so that you can have understanding. So you felt like you're not hearing understanding. Come out from under the judgment that you have on your life and step into God. Step into what He's created you to be. Amen? Because they can't hear, they can't understand. Job 28, 28 says this. It says, He said to the man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, to depart from evil is understanding. So if we gain understanding from hearing, yet we don't listen We're going to be stuck in the sand and not on the rock. Jesus died for all of us. His intent is that we all build on the foundation of who he is. Amen? If understanding is departing from evil and we don't get the understanding, we're going to be stuck. We have to get understanding of the Word of God or we're on sinking sand. You know, I was reading in Psalms 89 last week. Um... And it, and it talked about, he said in Psalms 89, verse 10, he said, You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. I thought, well, well who is Rahab? It just kind of jumped out at me. Who is Rahab? What, what does that mean? Because I only know of Rahab one way. In, in the book of Genesis, when they went to Jericho, or it's further down, it's in the book of uh, jo Joshua. They went to Jericho. There was Rahab, the harlot, who hid the two spies. And it says here, you have broken Rahab into pieces. But then I look in Matthew chapter 1, and Rahab is in the line of Christ. I'm like, okay, so what does this mean? So I went to, I grabbed my New Living Bible, I grabbed another version, I said, okay, what is it saying here? And the New Living Version, it says, you have broken the great sea monster in pieces. I'm like, the great sea monster? Rahab, the great sea monster. I said, okay, now I'm going to my Strong's. I went to Strong's and I looked up Rahab in the Strong's there. And it said, Egypt. The Lord broke Egypt, the great monster in Israel's life, in pieces so that they could be delivered. 
And the Lord spoke to me. He said, I have broken many monsters in your life. And I said, Lord, are there any more? Are there any monsters that you need to deal with in me? And I ask you the same question. Are there any monsters that need to be broken in pieces in your life today? Because our loving God will do it for us. He'll destroy that enemy. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord declares in Joshua 1.8, He said, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And what it means is, it's always there. It, it, it's, not, it's not an afterthought. The book of the law, the word of God, is always on the tip of your tongue. So you speak the word. You speak the word. You hear the word. You meditate on the word. And then do the word and then you make yourself prosperous and successful when you speak the word hear the word do the word speak everybody say speak, speak. Hear. hear do, do. there you go you'll be prosperous and successful that's the plan of Christ for us amen and you you will make your way prosperous and successful Romans chapter 10 verse 17 it says faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God so we know that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. I'm speaking the Word. My faith is increasing. Amen? Hebrews 11, 6, it says, But without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. It takes faith because you have to believe that He is. Amen? So it takes faith to believe. But listen, both groups of these people heard the Word. And that takes us into number two today. Do what you hear. That's what I love about when I, when I travel overseas. They just take it literal. When I was in Pakistan, and they, they told me, when you step up to the pulpit, take your shoes off. I'm like, why? I don't like to preach barefoot. You know, because I know I'm going to be up there a couple of hours barefoot on hard ground, you know. I'm like, I don't want to be barefoot, man. And they're like, well, because it's holy ground. I'm like, well, where do you get that at? And they said, well, when Moses, you know, approached the Lord, it was holy ground, take off your shoes. I'm like, you know, we're not bound to that, right? <laughs> but I'm going to take my shoes off. <laughs> you know, and, and that was the thing. I honored them and I took my shoes off. They just take it so literal, though. You know, when the guy took a beating for me when I was in China, he was so excited because he considered himself like one of the, the New Testament apostles that went through things, that took beatings, that received beatings. He was pumped, man. He was so excited that he took a beating for me and didn't give me up. Man, I'm crying because this guy just, he said, he said, they hit me, they kicked me. I'm not giving you up. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm thinking this guy, he's, he's excited. He's pumped because he's looking at the New Testament. This is what happens to the believers. We in America have experienced none of that. But over there, it's common. On the other side of the world, it's common practice to be beaten, to be tortured for serving Jesus. But here, we, we've had this freedom. Amen? So when we do what we, we hear, be doers of the word, James says. Not hearers only. Because when we only hear and we don't do, we're deceiving ourselves. You can't say, well, I went to church, I'm, I'm good. No! If you don't do it Monday through Saturday, you're not good. You're deceived. Because, I love that old adage, I mean, just because you sit in the garage doesn't make you a car, right? Just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. We have to do it. It has to be active in our lives. He said, for if anyone was a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing himself, his natural face in a mirror, and he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So that's like coming to church, hearing, hearing the word of the Lord, and going out and forgetting what you heard when you were in here. You just go about and do, your, do things your way. You get out your hula ho and you do it your way. That's what happens. There's, in, in Matthew chapter 13, he talks about four different kinds of people, and that's in this room today. 
we're one of these four kinds of people. He talks about the wayside, the stony ground. He talks about thorny ground. And he talks about the good ground. The, the wayside is this. It says, when anyone hears the word, everybody say hears. Yes. Hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away what was sown in his heart. So when, when, when we don't understand it and we go out and we don't invest to understand, like when I, when I went through that Psalms 89, I had to start digging because I wanted to find out what did Rahab mean. I wanted to find out. And then when I discovered, it is the, the sea monster. It is a monster that the Lord will destroy into pieces. And so even Tuesday night when we were at Celebrate Life, man, we're looking, we're examining our lives daily to see, is there any sea monsters in us that God needs to destroy? Anybody here got any monsters? Come on, man, if you're honest, you got monsters. You got things in your life that we need to get rid of, man. We all do. But he said, so that's the wayside. And then he says, but he received the ground, the seed in stony places. This is he who hears the word. Listen, hearing. Everybody's hearing the word, okay? And immediately receives it with joy. Oh, they're so excited. Man, I have had people that come and visit the church, and they're so excited when they hear. They're like, wow, how come this place isn't full? Oh, I believe God wants to fill this place. I'm so excited. You bring the word, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, you get it. And then they go out of this place, and then when they go out of this place, it says they have root in themselves but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. I remember this one lady, she came in, and she, she came to the altar, and she was so broken. She was crying so hard, Pastor Jesse. She was sobbing, and we prayed for her, and she left with like the weight lifted and much joy. And I didn't see her the next Sunday. Or the next Sunday, Six months went by, and she came back again. I'm like, hey, you're back. She's like, yeah. She goes, I went through so much after the last time I was here. Because, you see, the enemy of your soul knows this. He knows that if he can put stuff on you, if he can snap that seed away from you that you've received, if he can rob you of the joy when you go out the door, he'll do it. He'll do whatever he can so that you don't get a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. He'll snatch that seed away from you and, and we'll be going, hey, what happened to them? They were such nice people. You know, I mean, they, they didn't fill out a visitor card, Rob, so we can't call them, we can't send them a letter, we, we don't know where they live, we don't know nothing about them because we're so personal these days. We don't want anybody to judge us or anything, you know, so we don't like to give out too much information about ourselves because they might call me. Oh, man, I used to hate when they would call me. Because I, I wasn't always, I wasn't always been a pastor. But I was raised in church, man. And Delon and I, when we first got married, life was tough. It was hard. And so I, we would come to church. We wouldn't come to church. But then, man, if you didn't come a couple of weeks in a row, they called you. <sighs> man, you know, Pastor Jack, I'd tell Delon, it's for you. And I'd hand off the phone. But one day, man, Cindy, your dad called me. And he's talking. He talked to me for like 45 minutes. I'm like, oh, man. I hung up that phone. I said, we will never get that phone call again. We'll be in church every Sunday. I don't care what we look like when we get there. But we're going every Sunday. You know, I don't care. You know, I mean, it just didn't matter. It's like, I can't handle that phone call. I was, man, I came, Rob, I was sitting right where you were. But we had pews back then. But I was in the fourth row back on the center aisle. And then during the preaching, man, the Holy Spirit fell on me. Man, I start sobbing. I'm wailing. I'm trying to hide. I want to crawl under the pew. I was crying so hard. And Delonda's crying. And the pastor, Pastor Davey, stands up and he says, there's somebody here. He says, this is your last chance. I'm like, what? And God's speaking to me. I'm like, he could hear what God was saying to me. Because God said, but if you don't do it today, you're never going to do it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And Pastor Dave, there's somebody here that it's your last chance. And you know, usually I sat in the back one thing about me, you, you, if you get to know me, I'm obedient. 
Okay, when the usher says, you sit here, that's where I sit. I always like to pop in and sit in the back. No offense, you guys in the back row. But I always like to pop in and sit in the back row because my mom could see me. Delana's mom could see me. And um, Pastor Dave, I'd give him the wave. And, but then I could get out if it got too hot. You know what I'm saying? You know, you bow your heads, close your eyes, and exit out the door is what we did, you know? You're laughing because you know. So, uh, you know, the usher brought me down front, and I'm like, oh, man. And man, when the Holy Spirit fell on me, and then Pastor Dave starts reading my mail, I'm like, Oh my gosh, he says, there's somebody here, this is your last chance. He says, I'm not saying you're going to go outside and you're going to die, but this is the last time the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you to draw you to Christ. And I'm like, it's me, I got up, I ran. Delana thought it was her, she got up and ran too. A bunch of other people that ran that day too. Because God knows what we need. And I committed to Christ, man. I said, man, if you take away my smoke and my drink and my foul mouth, man, I'll serve you. And he did, and I'd have. He took it all away. One day. And I committed, and I've stayed the course. But when you receive the seed among the thorns, is he who hears the word. And the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. If overtime is keeping you out of church, I understand that in our society today, people got to work on Sundays. But if overtime, getting that extra buck is keeping you away from the Lord, you got an issue. There's some thorny ground involved. It, the word's getting choked out. And a hush fell over the room. <laughs> Come on, I know it's a little heavy, but it's truth, amen? The good ground. How many of you say, I'm good ground? Well, not everybody. Okay, here we go. So I'm talking to the right crowd. But he who's received the Seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, and who, is, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. See, when the understanding comes, remember Job 28, 28, understanding means we flee from evil. Uh, so when, when you hear the word and you receive it, you're like, oh, I'm going to repent for that today. I'm, I'm not coming out. I'm not leaving this place with that. And you repent, and you go out, and you're changed, and you're transformed. And you tell people, I, I, I don't do this anymore. They're like, hey, man, how come you don't come with us? Well, because I don't do that anymore. Well, how come? Well, because I, I met Jesus, man. Hi, Jesus. I'm serving God now. You know, it's not, not oh, well, Jesus won't let me go. No, I don't want to go. I want to do things God's way, Amen. That's my intent, to do things the way that he, he wants me to do it. There's the wayside, the stony places, among the thorns of the good ground. Only 25% are getting it. 25%. But it, it, when we do get it, it brings an increase. It brings an increase in our health, amen? It brings an increase in our finances. It brings an increase in our relationships, amen? That's the promise to us. But if only 25% are actually living out their faith, where does that leave the church today? We're weak and anemic. We need to live it out, amen? Doing, everybody say doing, is the evidence of faith. It's the evidence of faith. I do because I have faith. I don't have faith because I do. I do because I have faith in Jesus. I serve, you know, that's the thing. I have my job with the church, what you guys, what I'm paid to do. There's a job description for me that I do. But then I serve too. I, if, I, if I did just what I was paid to do, I would expect you to call a meeting and fire me. Because doing, I'm not a hireling. I don't do just what's expected. I want to go above and beyond, not because of any expectation, because I love Jesus. 
this is my life. Delonda, she knows, man. When I go home, what do we talk about? We talk about this. We talk about God. We talk about the church. We talk about the ministry. This is our life. We are sold out for it. Amen. It, it, it's, it's the way. It's the way of life. Doing is the evidence of faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, but believed. Things hoped for. And what is hope? It's a confident expectation of God's promise, provision, and character. See, when they told my mom, you have acute myeloid leukemia, we didn't say, oh, I hope you heal her, God. We said, God, we believe she's healed. We have a confident expectation in God's promise, provision, and character. And when she went back to the doctor for the bone marrow test, they said, hey, you don't have any leukemia in you anymore. See, when, when the doctor left the room and, and he said, hey, you got this and I'll give you a few minutes. And, you know, my mom, I, I, I slid my chair over in front of my mom and I said, I'm not even going to ask you how, how you're doing because I can't imagine somebody telling me i got maybe two months to live. That's, that's what they said, right, Mom? How many months? Six months? It's been six, five, six months since then. The doctor's like, wow, so there's no leukemia in her bone marrow anymore. No leukemia. They, they're still giving her treatments. She's still driving herself. They said, well, we don't want it to come back. It could come back. And it's like, Mom, it's not going to come back. I said, dye your hair, do what you want, do your nails. You are healed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but I'm just crazy that way, you know. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, we, we, we receive that hope in the Lord. And lastly, number three, and this is, remember, this is for both the sand and the rock. Number three, storms are going to come. Storms will come. You know, for both people, the rock and the sand people, storms will come. You'll experience rain, floods, and winds. Okay, you're going to experience these things. It happens. We live in a fallen world, and storms happen. The enemy of our soul will try to condemn you. He'll try to kill you. He'll try to get you to give up on your walk with Jesus. He'll do whatever he can. 